everyone. Can you hear me all right, or do I need the mic? Let's use the mic. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the Hello. There we are. Welcome. Welcome to SOCA, and welcome to a presentation that Deborah Garner and myself, we've been working on diligently since June was when I met Deborah. And uh, we're so excited. We're so thankful for all our presenters who are coming. And this is meant to be an informative and an exciting way to understand each other deeply more. Because uh, I believe that through education and through listening to each other, that that's how we come together. And so that, that's what this is all about. So thank you for your interest and thank you for coming. Um, I am gonna do, I'm gonna hand it over to Deborah. And then when Deborah is finished, I'm gonna just do a little bit of housekeeping for COVID of what we would like you to, the, to do in order to stay safe here. Deborah. Just want to little, literally echo that welcome. We got a little bit of feedback coming. Uh, but welcome to SOCA. Welcome to the Make It Different Foundation. What is color? What is race? This has been a journey, and we talked about it a little bit on Thursday night at a wonderful artist reception. It was very well, not only attended, but very well uh, participated. And it was just wonderful for people to come in from different parts of the community and the state from different towns, different backgrounds, uh, different experiences, and share why this is such an important topic for all of us to, for me, it was really about looking at race and color from a different lens, uh, really looking at it from a educational, as Mary said, I said, I wanna do something that is going to examine the root of the problem. And you know, as I shared on Thursday, if I hear the word systemic racism again, I, I said, I'll eat my mask. Because what we tend to do is we, we talk in jargon, we talk in rhetoric, and then we just sort of get caught up and we repeat the narratives that we've heard over and over and over again. And you know, I just feel that we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our children to really know what these constructs mean because people are dying People's lives have been, you know, have been destroyed for centuries, and we see that this legacy that we have is still very much with us, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So, again, it was with that in mind, it was with really looking at the condition of our communities and listening and listening and listening and really not hearing the source of where a lot of this is coming from. So. Again, the history of race and race origins is our topic for this week. We want you to just, again, be a critical uh, thinker and examiner of the information and the content. I think that we need more information for our meditations. You know, we want to be mindful, but what are we being mindful of? We want to be mindful of facts. We want to be mindful of truth. We want to understand what is driving us to relate to one another the way that we are. So that's really the, the foundation and the impetus for what we're doing. And uh, we, we haven't had a ton of time to work on this, but we've done a lot in a very short period of time, and we hope that that's reflected in the quality of what we're bringing to you today. Uh, I just want to bring up, and I know, Mary, you wanted to say something about COVID. I, I just also wanted to say that because of what's going on in our, our nation, in our world with COVID, we know about our president. I just want us to be mindful of that. Um, maybe take a moment and just meditate on that, a moment of silence, because we really are experiencing a tremendous upheaval in our nation. Just forget about the social and racial dynamic, but just our, our health crisis that we're currently dealing with. So Mary's gonna come up and give some important information about that. And uh, with all due respect, we just want to keep that in mind in terms of how we're going to flow for the rest of the session. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Um, yeah, 
very different times. But like we all know, to survive, we adapt and we change. And that's how we just keep going. So anyway, so you all have signed to har uh, hold harmless. I'm going to quickly go over. Um, we're, we're being a lot more stricter because of, like what Deborah said, everything that has happened has made us even more cautious. And we should be. We should be. We should be cautious for ourselves and especially for each other. Uh, so we're all, all wearing our masks. Yay. And, um, and we'll keep our six-foot distance. Where the chairs are done so that they are six feet from the head to head. So if there are those particles in the air, they're not going to reach the person behind you, thankfully. And uh, there is a traffic pattern we would like to, to use if you need to use the restrooms. Uh, first of all, the restrooms are down the hallway. You go down this way, and this is the way you'd like, we'd like you to go through this hallway. Take a left. They're on the right. When you're coming back, please come back through the gift store and then come around to your seat. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, and that's it. So again, thank you for being here. It's going to be a great presentation. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to make sure also everybody has a program. We're going to try to follow it. I'd like to just start by reading a quote from Marcus Garvey. And it says, a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Our children, as well as ourselves, we need to know where we're coming from, from a racial, cultural, however you want to juxtapose it. But we need to understand our lineage, our legacy, our history. And this is something that we really have to take as a personal responsibility for ourselves. In other words, we can't expect public education, which has really created a lot of these, what you would call systemic issues and problems, because education truly is the answer to a lot of the mystery or the X's or the unknown factors that really should not exist in 2020. The information is there, so the question becomes, why isn't it in a mainstream framework so that the general public would have regular and accessible access to the content that people need to make more informed decisions about race and color. So that's part of, again, the reason that we are taking this direction as an approach to these constructs. I wanted to just introduce our MC for the afternoon. His name is Mr. Maurice Robertson, and he is a member, a board member of the Harvard Jazz Society. Uh, he is a 2018 jazz journalist Association National Jazz Hero, 44 years of jazz, uh, uh, 44 year jazz radio announcer and volunteer on WWH.org and 91.3 FM. He's also a photographer and he's a participator, participating artist in this event. Can you please join us in welcoming Mr. Maurice Robertson? And we thank him so much for being here. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you all. Good afternoon, and again, thank Mary and staff for providing this wonderful space for this very thought-provoking show. We'll have an array of wonderful presentations this afternoon, but again, thank you to uh, Southington Community Cultural Arts Center for hosting this wonderful event. Our first presentation will be Creation by Frances McAlpine Sharp. She's a pioneering actress and community theater director and producer, former educator at Weaver High, and currently with Journey Riders. So let's uh, enjoy creation, a presentation, a video presentation by Frances McAlpine Sharp. Hi. My name's J.C. McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org.
and God stepped out on space and looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. And as far as the eye of God could see, darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. And God smiled, and the light broke, and the darkness rolled up on one side, and the light stood shining on the other. And God said, that's good. Then God reached out and took the light in his hands, and he rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun and he set that sun ablaze in the heavens. And the light that was left from making the sun, God gathered into a shining ball and flung it against the darkness, spangling the night with the stars and the moon. And down between the darkness and the light, <laughs> He hurled the world, huh? and God said, now that's good. Then God himself stepped down, and the sun was on his right hand, and the moon was on his left and the stars were clustered above his head, and the earth was under his feet, and God walked. And where he trod, his footsteps hollowed the valleys out and bowled the mountains up. Then God stopped and looked, and he saw the earth was hot and barren, so God stepped over to the edge of the world and he spat out the seven seas. He batted his eyes and the lightning flashed. He <laughs> clapped his hands and the thunders rolled and the waters above the earth came down. Oh, the cooling waters came down. And the green grass sprouted, and the little red flowers blossomed, and the pine tree pointed its finger to the sky, and the oak spread out her arms, and the lakes cuddled down in the hollows of the ground, and the river ran down to the sea, and God smiled again. Oh. And then the rainbow appeared and curled itself around God's shoulders. And then he waved his arms and raised his hands over the seas and over the land. He said, bring forth, bring forth. And quicker than God could drop his hands, fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the forest and the woods, and split the air with their wings. And God said, that's good. Then God walked around. And God looked around at all that he had made. Oh, he looked at his sun. He looked at his moon. He looked at his little stars. He looked at his world with all its living things. And God said, <laughs> I'm lonely still, 
So God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep, wide river, he sat down. And with his head in his hands, God thought. And thought. And thought. Uh, till he thought, I'll make me a man. Then up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay. Down by the bank of the river, he kneeled him down. Uh, this great God Almighty, who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the farmost corners of the night, who rounded the world in the middle of his hands uh, uh, this great god like a mammy uh, bending over her baby a uh, kneel down in the dust uh, toiling 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 over a uh, lump of clay until he shaped it into his own image and into it he blew the breath of life and man became a living soul. Amen. Amen. Yes, Francis McAlpine Sharp, a force to be reckoned with in the theater arts in the Hartford area for the past, I guess, 40 to 50 years. And uh, we thank Miss Sharp for presenting that. And uh, we're going to continue now. Let me just get my notes up. And uh, we're going to uh, present Dr. Charles Price, Three Centuries of Race, the Evolution and Impact of an Idea. I'd like to give some background information on this esteemed gentleman. Charles Price is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at Temple University and formerly at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Price's research, writing, and activity focus on black identity, life narrative genres, action research, community organizations, and community organizing, people-centered community development, and social movements with a geographic concentration on the United States and Jamaica. Price authored the book, Becoming Rasta, The Origins of Rastafari Identity in Jamaica, circa 2009, New York University Press, if you'd like to catch up to it. Co-authored the monograph, Community Collaborations, Promoting Community Organizing, also 2009, Ford Foundation, and many journal articles and book chapters. Price and a colleague recently completed a NSF-funded pilot stu study of black men and resilience in Greensboro, North Carolina, and Hartford, Connecticut, and is completing a book to be published with NYU Press, Rasta, The Evolution of a People and Their Identity. Let's warmly welcome Mr. Price, Dr. Charles Price. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 Well, Janae helps me get everything going. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Charles Price, and I am going to sort of quickly, briefly walk you through three centuries of race. And um, 
Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to have you just look around the room for a second. And what you will see are people with very different bodies, very different skin tones, very different hair textures. Can't see our noses and lips, but very different lip shapes, nose shapes, and so on. And so part of what I am going to argue to you today is, is that race is really about human effort to understand and to explain human variation, one, and two, to explain human evolution. That's really what a lot of race is about. Now, the problem for race, and I'm going to come back to this at the end, is, is that uh, the effort to explain and understand human variation and human evolution ran into a lot of obstacles along the way. We've not been able to rid ourselves of some of those obstacles. So over the course of the next, what, 45, 50 minutes or so, I am going to introduce you to a lot of ideas, a lot of people, a lot of things that are going to be completely new to you. I'm going to introduce you to the entanglement of science and race. That's a very significant and serious entanglement. And in fact, the divorce between the two has yet to fully happen even though the two don't get along very well today, but you're still not divorced. And then um, I'm going to also suggest to you some of the ways in which science and race together have shaped the world that we live in and the things that we understand, sometimes with significant impact. So that's pretty much the plan. Uh, I'm going to end somewhere with uh, some of the stereotypes that science and race have uh, bequeath to us, and um, I'll take questions from there. So I'll pull this down every so often to catch my breath. But can you hear me in the back? Everything good? Okay, good. All right, so the perspective on race that I'm going to present to you, as I suggest, is going to be very different from what you understand. And I believe for people to really understand race, we got to back up. We need some primers on a couple of things. Human evolution, human variation, and human adaptation. So I'm going to quickly walk you through a few important points. And I want you to hold these points in your mind because they're going to be critical to making sense out of some of the stuff that we're going to talk about later because it's going to seem perhaps disconnected. So in order to do this, you need to go back into prehistory. That didn't work, so why don't I just do it this way? You need to go back to prehistory. So, this is Homo erectus. Homo erectus existed roughly from about 2 million years ago, roughly to maybe 120,000 years ago. So that's quite a significant span of time. Homo erectus uh, probably evolved from another member of the Homo genus, Homo habilis. Homo habilis is important because Homo habilis is one of our ancestors. It's a member of the genus Homo. We're Homo sapiens, right? So it's one of our ancestors. Homo habilis walked up, right? And one of the significant things about Homo uh, habilis is that Homo habilis, without a doubt, was one of the first humans, or first group of humans, species of humans, to have, without a doubt, a toolkit. Homo habilis is known as handyman. So Homo habilis was making tools. Homo habilis was moving around Eastern Africa. And so Homo erectus is a descendant of that. Now the reason I bring up Homo erectus is because Homo erectus quickly leaves Africa about 1.8 million years ago. Homo erectus leaves Africa, spreads across the old world, settles in Far East Asia. So Homo erectus was able to traverse the entire continent over to what we might now think of as China and further, but also later to sell into some parts of what we would now know today as Europe. So Homo erectus is important. 1.8 million years ago, leaves Africa. All right? Now, we understand this by examining the fossil record. And I'm going to introduce you to two explanations for what this means for us today. And we can come back to these at the end. 
So the first, let's look at the left, is what we call the multi-regional hypothesis. Okay? What the multi-regional hypothesis says to us is, is that Homo erectus left Africa on foot 1.8 million years ago, settled the rest of the world, the old world, that is not the new world, and that all of us, each one of us, is a descendant, a direct descendant of Homo erectus. Okay? So what this says is that modern humans, people who look like you and I, evolved independently in different parts of the world. Africa, Asia, Europe, later the New World. That's one argument for explaining human evolution and human variation. Different types of people we see, how we get these different types of people. They evolve in different climates, in different conditions, in this case over a very long period of time. The multi-regional hypothesis is under attack now, and it's being superseded by another way of explaining human variation and human evolution, and it's called the out of Africa hypothesis. Multi-regional, based on fossil evidence, can't go into that now, but the out of Africa uh, hypothesis now is based in genetic evidence. And so we're looking at different types of evidence, but the out of Africa hypothesis says that the variation that we see in this room today is recent. 1.8 million years ago, we're talking 60, 100,000 years ago. So what this thesis says is, is that modern humans, our ancestors look very much like us, not like Homo erectus, left Africa 60,000 to 100,000 years ago and settled the world. Homo erectus was there, we don't argue about that, okay? But those modern humans replaced Homo erectus. So this model says that the differences, the variation that we see is very recent, okay? And it occurred over ways, but both models trace our ancestors to the continent of Africa, but involving different times and frameworks. Now, this is important because these are contemporary understandings, and you're going to see that scientists have been struggling to explain the same thing using very different frameworks. Anthropology played a major role in the development and understanding of race. Uh, psychology would come to play an important role later on. But what anthropology was trying to do was to systemize how we explain human variation and human evolution. And in doing so, anthropology was working with many of the prejudices and misunderstandings of human variation and race of that time, and some would argue well up to the present. So I took these from some book on race, and you see there, um, you have a Native American on the left and an Asian there character on the right, and they're both talking about impact of race, the impact that race has had on how not only they are understood, but how they understand themselves. So the native on the left there says, for instance, well, all of a sudden, I don't have a history. You know, all of a sudden, we don't change anymore. So race has had a significant impact on how people understand the world and how people understand themselves. A few more things as far as the permagoes. I keep telling you about human variation. In order to understand human variation, a couple of basic things we need to hold in our heads. One is phenotype, and the other is genotype. So phenotype is what you see when you see someone else, right? That's the external body. That's the exterior that we see, right? Now, the phenotype is influenced in shape by a number of factors. The environment, for instance, adaptation to different environments, but it's also a reflection of our genotype. Now, we can't see the genotype. What we see is the phenotype, right? So part of what's happening is that people are trying to explain the differences that they see based on what they see, guessing what's behind what they see. So they don't have a real understanding of the genotype, but the genotypes are also influenced 
by environment. But for a long time, people don't understand how that works. Another important point that we need to bring to our understanding of race is, is that humans are polytypic. And what does that mean? Polytypic means many types. So humans are a species composed of many different types. We understand there's different types, right? And these types manifest in different shapes, body shapes, different facial features, different skin tones, and so on. So hold that in your head, right? Polytypic, all right? Variation, phenotype, genotype. So let's take a couple of these as an example to sort of help us understand variation and how that looks as far as bodies and uh, morphology goes, or body shape goes, and skin uh, color. So let's just imagine that this graphic represents the Earth pre-Columbus, so pre-1492. So what we can do is we can imagine that 1490, if we could sort of survey the globe, we would find that the, excuse me, the distribution of skin colors, skin tones, skin type, would literally sort of play out this way. We would find that the people with the darkest colored skin would be clustered around the equatorial zones, perhaps in places with a higher off, uh, higher altitudes and so on, but we would find a distribution of color that had a lot to do with ultraviolet radiation. So one of the challenges for our ancestors, like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and those that came before them, was to adapt to an environment with intense ultraviolet radiation. One of the ways in which the body adapts to intense ultraviolet radiation is through the production of melanin. Melanin helps protect us from this intense ultraviolet radiation because this radiation can harm us, can kill us. Skin cancer, for instance, is one of the consequences of intense ultraviolet radiation. So the dark skin colors we see are a response to environmental challenges, for people to adapt and survive a particular type of environment. Another challenge is, is that the sun also endows us with vitamin D. Now, if your body produces too much melanin, it's not able to capture that vitamin D. But if you are in an environment with intense ultraviolet radiation, melanin is not necessarily an obstacle to you acquiring the vitamin D that you need given your body is, uh, your skin is open and available to sunlight. But just imagine now, humans radiating into environments where there is less intense ultraviolet radiation, less intense sunlight. Too much melanin production becomes non adaptive. Then you need lighter skin. You need lighter skin that will allow your body to capture vitamin D, for instance, from sunlight because we need vitamin D. Okay? So, in a shell, what I'm trying to point out to you is that part of the variation that we see is a reflection of our bodies adapting to environmental challenges over extremely long periods. So far, it has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with survival of the human species, or our ancestor species. Now, there are other sort of uh, variations that we associate with race that are also explained by very similar things. So another one we can take uh, would be body shape and limb appendages. So one of the ways that humans adapted to extremely hot climates is developing bodies that have very slender appendages, arms and legs, very slender torsos. It's an adaptation that allows the body to efficiently dissipate heat, to keep it from overheating. There are other things as well, but that's one example. Tightly curled hair helps protect against uh, intense ultraviolet radiation. Thicker bodies, on the other hand, are very effective adaptations in cold bodies. Thick bodies, Short appendages, shorter arms, shorter legs, thicker arms, thicker legs, help conserve heat, help conserve energy. So when we look at bodies, which we often think of in racial terms, we're also really looking at adaptations to environmental challenges, adaptations that go back for millennia. So a lot of what we think about race and how we organize people in the racial categories 
not so much about race, but about human adaptation. So that raises the question for us is how do we make sense of race, and why and how do people use race to try to make sense of human variation and human evolution? Is this man black or white? Black, how many say he's black? One, two, only two people say he's black? Three, she said no. All right, how many say he's white? All right, most of you say he's white. Oh boy. First of all, I'm not going to ask you to say, say this out loud, but I'm curious as to know what makes you think the man is black or white? What is it about him that makes you say this man is black, he's not black? You've got some ideas about what black means or what white means, right? Now, just for the record, this man is William Cross. He was one of my dissertation advisors. Bill Cross identifies as black. In fact, Bill is probably one of the foremost theorists of black identity, all right? But I'm going to make a point here, a larger point that we're going to come back to, and that is, is that when we come down to dealing with race, one of the things that we have to understand, this we understand through science, is, is that there's more variation within a racial category than between races. So what this says to you is, is that for any racial group you take, there's going to be more difference within that one race than between races. Does that make sense to you? That seems counterintuitive, right? That's one of the challenges that race poses for us when we try to understand human variation. Are these people black? She said no. She said yes. Yeah. All right, so quickly, like, yes. Yeah. So why do you think they're black? Skin yeah. color. Yeah. All right? And she's like, yeah. So why do you think they're not black? Yes, sir. Because they look Asian. Because they look Asian to you. And what about them looks Asian? Oh, the features, the hair. The hair. Okay, all right. So we're looking at these phenotypes. And we're trying to make sense of these phenotypes. And we're trying to organize these people into categories based on the way that they look. But in fact, these people in this particular image are far darker than many of the people we would designate as black. All right, so we've got another example now that reinforces the point that I just made to you about human variation and race. And you were right, sir, they, they are from South Asia. So, a couple of things here, and I stay on point with my time here, is, is that I have reached a point where I don't engage in conversations about race unless people are willing to define what it is that they're talking about. Because when you don't define what you're talking about, all you're doing is talking past each other. I think Deborah made the important point, institutional racism is a good uh, example. It's not this talk, but I think there are four perspectives that you have to bring together to have an intelligent conversation about race, and the institutional or structural perspective is only one of those four examples. But just for our intents and purposes, I'm going to walk you through four things. One is, category, uh, the definition of race itself. Race is simply our definition for an abstract category that we use to organize human similarities. It's an abstract category, meaning that it's just a set of ideas that we have about people and about the world. That's it. What we have to understand next is racialization. How is it that these ideas that we have about people take on a life of their own? So there are all kinds of things that we do that we don't even pay attention to that bring race to life. And so one of the first things that's going to help breathe life into race is science. Science is going to help bring this thing to life. So racialization are processes by which the categories of life, these abstract categories, ideas that don't really exist, all right, that are completely arbitrary, racialization helps bring them into existence and breathe life. Next important thing that we have to understand is racial identity. It's not enough to have the categories. It's not enough to have the institutions and the people who help bring these things to life. People have to sort of say to themselves, I'm black, I'm white, I'm Asian, I'm this, I'm that. So we also have to understand racial identity. That is the ways by which people come to embrace and to accept, on the one hand, the racial categories, the racial processes, but also 
to deal with the fact that whether or not they like it, people will also ascribe these things to them. What do I mean by ascribe? They will impose them on you. So even if you don't see yourself that way, people will give you a racial identity. Okay? And finally, racism. You have to be really careful. And I would urge you to always, when we get together, talk about race, and come up with a definition of racism. Because if you do not come up with a definition of racism, you will find racism everywhere you look. If your idea of racism is about prejudice and discrimination. We can talk about the causes of prejudice and discrimination for many, but some of them are just byproducts of the fact that we're social animals, that we have preferences for certain kinds of people, and that's for others. Right? It doesn't have to be about hate or anything like that. So for me, a definition of racism is a belief that some people are inherently inferior to other people. Inherently superior. That is, you are born less, or you are born better. And if you were born less or born better, that means that we can't do much about it. We just got to deal with the problem that you present for us or the opportunity that you present for us, right? So in, in this particular instance, my view is, is that if racism, uh, if it doesn't meet that definition, then I've got to figure out what's, what else is going on, right? But there are a lot of people who do subscribe to this idea that some people are born a certain way. And for me, those are the reasons, okay? You may come up with different definitions, we can talk about that later. So define race, the processes, as a part of having any intelligent conversation about race. So what I'm going to do now is to slowly walk you into some of the origin of these ideas about race, about races, uh, about human variation and human evolution. And the good starting and jumping off point for this is a debate that goes all the way back to the 1700s really predicts that, but let's say 1700s, that's between two camps, two theoretical perspectives, two theories about human variation and human evolution, the monogenes and the polygenes. How many of you have heard these before? One person back there, one anthropologist student, right? Nurse. Okay, nurse, all right, good, all right? I'm gonna give you more definition shortly, but let me just say a few things to give you some sense because these are probably new terms for you, right? Monogenists believe that all humans have a common ancestor, same ancestor. Those ancestors are Adam and Eve. That all humans, all the variation that we see in the world, in this world, stems from the fact that we've evolved from Adam and Eve. Right? We're very different, but we have this common ancestor, Adam and Eve. You can already see now that the explanation for human variation and human evolution is now theological. God is a central part of the explanation for the variation and the evolution of our species. The polygenists, on the other hand, said, wait a minute, no. There's no way in the world you can explain all the variation that we see by recourse to the evolution of people from Adam and Eve. First of all, Adam and Eve must have been European. They had to be white. So you can't explain all this variation. So there must have been multiple races from the beginning. There must have been multiple races that lived in different parts of the earth. And what God did was God and God's infinite wisdom said, okay, I'm going to put some people over here in Europe. I'm going to put some, um, excuse me, not people. I'm going to put an Adam and Eve in Europe. I'm going to put an Adam and Eve over here in the Far East. All right, and I'm going to put an Adam and Eve in the Africa. And all the variation that we see is a result of Adam and Eve in these three major regions of the world, right? Now, the implication of this for the polygenesis is that if we have three separate races, three separate origins, then the question becomes, are all of them equally human? Okay? And most polygenists don't think that those different races are all human. This seem unreal to you so far? Yeah. Like crazy, right? All right, so basically, um, let's say a little bit more about the monogenists. The monogenists, for me, looking back in the past, are interesting because they're kind of like the equivalent of today's liberals, white liberals, right? Monogenists believe that, okay, 
All right, we all trace our ancestry back to Adam and Eve, but the way that you explain variation is climate, it's environment. And if it's climate and environment, then that means that people change, they adapt, and sure, I think we Europeans are better and smarter than all these other people, but if we Europeans are godly and do our due diligence, we can help lift these people up to our level. Okay? So the monogenists had a very plastic view of human evolution and humankind. We were the same species, not equal, but same species, but we could all be brought up to the same level. So that means now that you can implement policies like education policies that can help people achieve the level of Europeans if you take this point of view. The polygenists said, to go back to where we were, no. We're different races and we are not equal. And it's futile to invest any effort and to bring, uh, into attempting to bring these other races up to the standards and the level of Europeans. So polygenism and monogenism shape our thinking about human relation well into the 20th century. And the leading polygenists, the leading monogenists, are not necessarily preachers, rebels, and so forth, imams, they were scholars, they were scientists. And so that the fact that these ideas are coming from some of the most learned scholars of the time enforces these ideas about human variation and human evolution. Quickly run through a few of these. Uh, let's see how we do it on time. All right, so I gotta speed up a little bit. Not gonna talk about all of these, but what's important here is to note that Monogenism and polygenism began as debates about human evolution and human variation, but polygenism would come to supersede monogenism. In fact, monogenism would adopt it. And there are very real reasons for why polygenism takes over and monogenism disappears. And one reason is, is that polygenism suits the needs of people at that particular point in time and achieving particular goals. I think this will become clear to you uh, shortly. So these are a few of the names and people that I'm going to briefly sort of talk about. I'm not going to say anything about Isaac de la Piri, except to say that Isaac was one of the early race theorists. He got himself into a lot of trouble because even though he was an early polygenist, his argument was is that um, Jews formed a separate race uh, that preceded Christians. A lot of people didn't like that. They burned his book and they threw him in prison. All right. Henry Cames comes along and says a few things about him. Uh, about Plato's idea of essence, and I'm going to skip uh, Lamarck. So let's fast forward here to Francois Bernier. Francois Bernier, like so many of these people are going to come forward, is one of the early race theorists, and Bernier is really traveling the world. He's an explorer, he's an adventurer, he's a physician, he's all these things, right? And he's seeing all these different kinds of people. He's trying to make sense of how to explain all of this variation and what does it have to do with the evolution of humans, right? And so Bernier decides that he is going to organize all of the people in the world into races. And so he comes up with several races. One, just to give you an example, I'm going to get your reaction to this. One of his races included uh, North Africans, Europeans, uh, Egyptians, um, and I'm forgetting a couple of the others. But he had like five different groups in one of his races, right? So what strikes you there? What do those have in common? North Africa, Europe, uh, uh, Madagascar. They don't have much in common. Who's making this shit up, all right? Race is arbitrary. In other words, it's all up to the intellect, right? To, determined to designate who and what fits into a given category. To give you a further example, Bernier had a race of people that he called the LAPS, L-A-P-P-S. 
And for each of these races, Bernier attributed particular behavioral characteristics to them, and um, he also described them. So for instance, Africans he described, uh, and he organized them according to the shape of their lips, the uh, shape of their noses, their hair texture, and so on. Uh, the Asians he organized into skin color. For him, Asians were the original white people, um, and he organized them according to eye shape and so on. But these folk, it's like, why, why does this particular category serve to be their own race? So the laps that he uh, identified as a race, he de designated as a race, are really an indigenous people who are indigenous to Russia, Finland, uh, Norway, Sweden. They're herders. Okay, they're nomadic peoples, um, at least that's how they live. But there was something about the Sami people that he detested. He hated them, he despised them, and he despised them so much that he gave them their own category so he could wreak havoc upon them, all right? So he could describe them in very negative ways, all right? So early on, we see that the racial categories that are created are arbitrary, all right? But the fact that they are arbitrary and they don't make a lot of sense doesn't mean that they don't stick with us. Um, this book, Henry Holmes, Lord Keane, Sketches of the History of Man, is probably the first theoretical treatment of polygenism. It becomes important because you will see, and you can't see it there, I can see it on my screen, but down at the bottom there, you'll see that this was published in 1774. What would happen two years later? American Revolution, American Revolution right? These ideas and these books posed by scholars like this are influencing how people think about politics, how they think about nation, how they organize politics and nation. Things start to get really systematic with good old Carolus Linnaeus. How many of you have heard of Carolus Linnaeus? She, she knows it all. I know, you can come and help me, I like that. Nurses have to study. And you know, why do nurses have to study this dude? Because he classifies things. This guy is the father of modern taxonomy. In other words, he created the system for organizing plants and animals in the natural world. That's this guy right here. But he didn't stop with plants and animals. He said, well, you know what? I do the same thing for humans too. So, you know, phylum, order, the kingdom, phylum, order, all the way down to species, like Carolus designed that. But he also applied it to humans. And so for Carolus, he identified four races. You can't see there at the bottom there, but there's Homo, me, Homo Europaeus, Europeans. There's Homo Asiaticus, or Asians. There's Homo Americanus, Indians. And there's Homo Afro, or Africans. For each of these races, Carolus identified behavioral characteristics, okay? The leading scholar and scientist of his time. So his model, in his model, Africans are described as lazy and dull. Europeans are sharp and elevated. Indians are freedom-loving people and happy. And Asians he described as greedy, and what was the other one? Strict. So we have now pronouncements by scholars like Aeneas, leading thinkers of their time, who are not merely organizing people into categories, they are ascribing behavioral qualities and characteristics to these categories. So if you are a member of that category, this is how we expect you to behave. Blumenbach takes us a step further. Johann Blumenbach, German anatomist, Actually a monogenist, a liberal for his time. Interesting character. He's playing around too, leading scientists of his time. He's playing around with these ideas too, and he comes up with another racial designation scheme. And then here's their five races, Caucasoids, Mongoloids, Americans, Ethiopians, Malayans. And note here that each race is associated with a color. All right, so, the history of the colors goes back further, but he is now providing a context for somehow some association between humans and particular colors, all right? Now, what's interesting about Blumenbach, from my point of view, is, is that he actually didn't believe this, all right? 
he understood that what he had done was arbitrary. That, you know, I just made this up. You know, I'm, I'm taking what these other guys have done, and it's interesting. But he understood that. But the problem was is that not everyone else understood what he understood. And they took Blumen Bach's ideas and applied them widely. All right? What Blumen Bach did that got us into trouble was that even though he understood humans were malleable, plastic, uh, shaped by climate and environment, he believed that there was one thing that we could study that would help us understand human variation and human evolution because it didn't change. The one unchanging thing that Blumenbach argued was a human skull. So Blumenbach sets in motion now a new shift in orientation that is concerned with focusing on the human skull and brain as a way to organize human variation and to explain human evolution and a lot of other things. Just for a second, you can't read all this text, don't worry about it. If somebody saves this for you, you can read it later. But um, what I did was I took a brief clip from Thomas Jefferson's Notes on Virginia. Thomas Jefferson published one book, Notes on Virginia. How many of you knew that? Okay, all right. If you want to understand how these ideas translate into the current world, how racialization works, this is a good example. Go to Notes of Virginia. In Notes of Virginia, you will see Thomas Jefferson's ideas about race at the time. He is, in essence, really concurring with all of the polygenists. Even though he is a slave owner, and many of the polygenists are slave owners, even though he's having sex with his enslaved women, he has some very dark ideas about African descended people, that they are inferior, that there is no help for them. And even though he wants to do something about enslavement, he's torn because he doesn't feel that these people are responsible enough to handle freedom. So these ideas, these abstract ideas about race, are really translating into practical reality. All right, so I told you about Blumenbach and his focus on skulls as a way to explain human variation and human evolution. Samuel Morton, up the end, significant. So by now what we have is a development of a science now called craniometry, the study of the measurement of skulls. And the assumption there is, is that if we collect enough skulls and we measure them, then we can make claims about human differences because these differences really will be manifest in behavior, for instance. So one of the assumptions that men like Morton have is, is that bigger heads mean bigger brains. Bigger brains mean you must be smarter. Smaller head means that you have less brains and you're probably less smart. So they set out now to prove this theory. Morton, for instance, ran around literally the world, collecting skulls. He had people bring him skulls. So he had a collection, like over a thousand skulls. The thing is, is that these skulls came from everywhere. Prisoners, casualties of war, pauper graveyards, wherever he could get a skull. And he gave these skulls designations. He labeled them Caucasian, he labeled them Mongolian, he labeled them Malay, American, Ethiopian, and so on. Ethiopian is African. No real way to prove that these skulls represented these races or these people, but that's what he did. So at the time, one of the primary ways for measuring skulls was to take a skull, turn it upside down, fill it up with stuff. All right, and the material at the time was sand. You could also use seed. If you were serious about your science, you should probably have used something like steel shot. Because the problem with sand and seed is that you can, it can pack inside the skull, so it's hard to get a consistent measurement. They take this material, pour it out, and measure it, right? So based on this work, Martin concluded that Europeans were the most intelligent. They most intelligent, they had the largest brains, largest heads, and Africans were the least intelligent, they had the smallest head, thus the smallest brains. 
science. Now, of interest here is we know Morton. Morton is famous scientist, famous scientist. Okay? He published this book called Cranium Americana where he sort of goes through all these skulls that he's collected and he talks about each one of them. And some of the drawings are actually quite beautiful. Another German scholar, Friedrich Tiedemann, who you don't hear about, did almost the same study using the same technique and came to a completely different conclusion. That there was no basis for organizing people based on the size of their skull and thus the size of their brain. So two leading scientists coming to very different conclusions using the same kind of material. Right? We don't know much about Tiedemann, but Morton came to influence science for decades. One of the reasons he did was because Morton's scientific conclusions supported slavery. Because if Africans were inferior, they had smaller brains, why are we worried about them? Okay? If Native Americans have smaller brains and they're less intelligent, why are we worried about them? Okay? So Morton's ideas carry the day. I didn't even learn about Tiedemann when I was an undergraduate, right? I kind of learned about this over the past 15, 20 years. This turns up, uh, this thinking, uh, this science turns up in so many different ways. So this is a book by Josiah Knott where he decides he's going to organize the varieties of mankind. He's going to create all these drawings and so they show you different types. And so for instance, one of his sketches over here one of his sections involves sort of identifying the different varieties of Negroes. So you can see over here on the right hand side, essentially what you have are a range of stereotypes of what Europeans imagine African descended people to be, to look like, and how they behave. Now I'm going to come back to this in a second, um, but over here again, these are dominant ideas, right, based in the skull, which is trying to explain human evolution and human variation. And what you see here is at the top is the ideal, which is a Greek uh, sculpture. And you'll see that there's almost perfect symmetry between the jaw and the nose of this skull. Okay? Now, you see the exact opposite down here with the ape, right? The jaw is jutting out. Scholars at that time called this prognathism, and the argument was that um, different types of humans exhibit different degrees of prognathism. That is the relationship, the ratio between the jaw and the forehead. The more vertical, the more intelligent, the more superior, the more beautiful, the more unequal the slant, the uglier, the less intelligent. Now what you see is that in this diagram, Africans are right down there with these. In fact, in some of these diagrams, the prognathism of the ape is far greater than that of the African. And these are the kinds of images that people are being fed in newspapers, in popular magazines, in drawings. This is what they see. So there's no coincidence that Africans, for instance, are equated with apes and monkeys. This is coming from science. So I told you about craniometry, and these are some of the tools that these scientists concocted to prove the differences among the races in terms of head shape and skulls. One of the leaders in this new science of craniometry was a man named Petrus Camper, anatomist, naturalist, zoologist, anthropologist. He's the one who developed this theory of prognathism. Uh, I'm reluctant to call Camper a racist. But what he was really trying to show was that Europeans were more attractive than the other races. So a lot of his work was to sort of demonstrate that point that Europeans were much more attractive, uh, not necessarily some of the things that uh, not and others attributed to different races. Also around this time, other ideas now are going to continue to get us in trouble, and one is phrenology. How many of you have ever heard of phrenology? All right. It's the idea that the shape of the head can tell you a lot, if not everything, about a person's personality and intelligence. Just by feeling the head, you can determine how smart they are, what their personality is like, right? Now, <clears throat> the fact that people would take this serious, and many people do, this is quite popular in the United States, okay? They take this serious, it's also reflecting the fact that they are associating, associating this excuse me, with scholarship. 
This idea of explaining human variation and human evolution by recourse to the skull and intelligence and so on literally takes on a life of its own, and Europeans begin to apply it to themselves, to other Europeans, because part of what is happening now is, is that if there's going to be a hierarchy of races, then within the races there's a hierarchy, and part of what Europeans were trying to do was to demonstrate this hierarchy, in part because of what was happening in the real world, and that is an influx of immigrants from Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, in the United States after the Civil War, and again in the early 20th century. And the reason was is that these hordes of immigrants from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe were inferior to the Northern Europeans and the Western Europeans. And so they came up with all kinds of measures to prove this. And one was what they call a dolocephalic and a brassocephalic index, right? I won't go into detail there, but just tell you. Dolocephalic means narrow head. Uh, brassocephalic means broad head. Dolocephalic people are the most intelligent people. And they were basically Western and Northern Europeans. Brassocephalic, the wide heads, were Southern Europeans and Eastern Europeans, right? So again, scientists trying to prove differences between people based uh, in, uh, in physical features. Here's where everything starts to get even slippery. All right, I'm almost out of time, so can you bear with me 10 more minutes? Mm -hmm. All right. um, how many of you have heard of Francis Galton? Sir Francis Galton, my nurse back there. Sir Francis Galton is important in a number of reasons, but his legacy is with us to this very day. Francis Galton was a cousin of Charles Galton. And Francis Galton, brilliant, we're not going to take anything away from him, brilliant scholar and scientist. Galton had a number of things that he wanted to prove as a scholar and scientist. His first question was, being the great man that he is, or was, excuse me, and in the fact that he was part of a family of brilliant people like Charles Darwin, Darwin, brilliant man, he wondered why there were so many brilliant men among the British aristocracy. And he set out to prove that the only way you could explain so many brilliant men among such a small population of people was that intelligence had to be and he set out to prove that. But he had a second concern. The second concern was the idea that the white race was being overrun by other races. And in fact, if the government didn't do something to halt these other races, the white race would be run over and would literally vanish. So the white race needed protection and the government needed to do this protecting. And what Galton did was create science of eugenics. Eugenics is a science of race improvement. The science of race improvement. Okay? And the idea there is through selective breeding, for instance, of geniuses, you can improve the race, in this, in this case, the white race, right? This wasn't the idea for the other races, not to improve them, but to keep them from reproducing. So these other races were labeled uh, excuse me, feeble and inferior. And so the role of government was to do everything possible to minimize the number of children these people could have. And the preference was no children, no ability to reproduce. Not making this up. Galton was so serious and these ideas were so important that there were scholarly societies devoted to eugenics, all right? A journal of eugenics, a scientific journal of eugenics. They were applying this to everything. They believed, for instance, that you could identify criminals, right? And if you could identify criminals, you could, uh, help me, what's the word I'm, uh, I'm looking for when you stop people from preventing people from having children? Sterilize, all right? That if you sterilize certain people, you could prevent these social problems. Just to show you how widespread this was, Throughout the 1920s into the 1930s, all across the United States, there were eugenics competitions to identify the most fit white families. 
Here's a family here, I think from the Kansas State Fair, 1920. All right, large families were frowned upon, but if you're gonna have a large white family, this is what they ought to look like. So there were competitions all over the country, across Europe, to identify these ideal types, okay? This thinking, this line of thinking, develops its own scholarship. Carl Pearson, Charles Spearman, Francis Dalton. So from Dalton, we get Pearson, we get Spearman. Each of these men develops an array of statistical techniques to prove that intelligence is hereditary and to prove that environment is not what we need to pay attention to, but we need to pay attention to heredity. So if you heard of the two-factor coalition, uh, excuse me, correlation, if you heard of chi squared, if you heard of Pearson's R, Spearman's G, uh, all of these were measures that these guys designed to show the inferiority among races. Okay? All right, Cyril Byte is another one, education psychologist. Part of their aim was to really prove that environment is not a major influence on intelligence, all right? That it's all inborn, and if we can prove that, then all of you who want to say it's about schools, it's about education, it's about your standard of living, we're just proving that, all right? We're going to say it's hereditary, and there's nothing we can do about it. How many of you heard of the bell curve? The bell curve is a direct product of this lineage of thinking. And it essentially argues in contemporary terms that if you look at the class distribution in the United States, those at the top are literally the smartest. Those who earn the most, and those who earn the least, they earn the least for a reason. Why do you think they don't earn much? Because they're not as smart as the people who earn a lot. That's essentially the thesis of the bell curve. I'll close out with this. Um, this line of thinking continues to evolve, and a lot of the stereotypes that we think about people, whether it's having uh, children at a certain age, whether it's about the size of genitals, whether it's about people uh, being law-abiding or whatever, these scholars have set out to prove this, in quotes, by recourse to science or pseudoscience. So everything from genital size to fertility to law-abidingness have all been turned into variables, and you'll see that blacks always end up on the low end of the scale. What's slightly different here is that for Rushton, he puts Asians sort of at the top because his argument is that Asians are now surpassing Europeans in terms of fitness. So I'll, I'll close up by just making a few points, all right? One is, is that we say race is a social construct, but that's not enough, all right? It is a social construct but it's a social construct that has very serious consequences, okay? So we understand that over the years, people have made it up, they've made things up, but these things have very serious consequences. We've also seen that science has been essential to the proliferation of ideas and doctrines, and it remains this. And what we've got to be especially vigilant about today is genes, because genes have taken the place of skulls, all right? And all of us are getting uh, DNA tested and all of these other things. We have to be very careful about how this new genetic evidence will be used to support ideas about human inferiority and human superiority. So I'm, I'm running it's late there. I'm going to close out right there. And if you have questions, I'll take them. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Price. Uh, there are a ton of questions, at least from this uh, listener, but I know we are you know, running low on time. Um, a lot was covered, and really, I'm, I'm thinking about this event now, and I'm saying, gee, you know, maybe we could have done four weeks of just one thing, because there's so much to cover. But the good thing is, is that there's gonna be a lot of information that's gonna be posted on the website, on the blog site, we want to have different uh, conversations, different perspectives. Everyone, I'm sure, that was listening to that may not uh, wholeheartedly necessarily agree with uh, uh, evolution theory or whatever. Just to offer a couple of questions for those, because those are usually the two major camps. You got non-evolution, you got evolution, or you got creation design versus evolution. So just a couple questions that 
I want to just throw out into the audience or into the listening recorded audience uh, that will hear this later, which is, do we all have the same genetic code? So these are questions. I'm going to just float these as balloons. You can go back to them later on your own time. Another question that many of us have is, why isn't evolution happening now? So that's just something that you can research, think about, because this is about critically examining information and sharing and respecting the opinion and the disciplines of others. Another question is, if evolution is a real process, again, why isn't it happening, happening now? And are there any transitional forms of evolution that we can go back and observe? So can we see from maybe a vertical model these transitions of when you went back to the original, I think it wasn't Homo sapien, it was Homo erectus, or maybe it was even someone before that. Um, but can we, can we go back and see, uh, uh, can we observe that there has been these forms that we can identify to say, okay, uh, we went from this form and now we're looking at a different form in terms of the historical record. Another question might be, uh, you know, do we see or is there any evidence of variation within a particular kind or, or category? So do, how does that fit into our understanding of, of evolution? Uh, another question could be uh, the formation of a new species. Have we ever really seen that? So these are just quick questions that I have just based on my own worldview, and I know that some of you may have some of those either, uh, have some of those as well. Um, questions about macroevolution and, and the fact that these uh, changes, have they been observed, and, and you know we can go on and on. But I just want to get to our next presenter quickly because we are kind of pressed with time. Uh, Maurice, if you can just come up and we're going to get started with our next guest. Okay, it's with uh, great pleasure to announce that uh, Lee Mixashan Razi, the wave artist, will be coming on next. Lee Mixashan Razi has been practicing multidisciplinary and internationally acclaimed, is a multidisciplinary and internationally acclaimed jazz artist for the past three decades. Mr. Razi holds a degree in history and ethnomusicology from Trinity College and is equally at home in academic and cultural settings. Beginning from the point of indigenous artists using ancient cultural principles, maritime arts, and historical data, both written and oral, he has developed a system of hemispheric principles to inform and guide his art form, more directly referred to as wave art. Sonic, aquatic, percussive, and harmonic is how wave art will come to you. Nick Sashan offers musical performance and educational workshops on indigenous music, traditional and contemporary, as well as original workshops that utilize his extensive experience as performer, indigenous artist, and educator to inspire creativity and natural expression for all ages. Let's uh, warmly welcome Lee Mixashan Razi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit, but uh, I'm going to play more music because, in my understanding, music is uh, is one of the ways that you get things across. Uh, but right now, before I really get too deep into this, let me just tell you that I'm going to talk a little about indigenous indigenous music, indigenous uh, indigenous civilization, how it's evolved, and in terms of. Uh, Evolution, I think the evolution is an ongoing thing. So I'm going to uh, deal in this next few minutes with the evolution of music and how its roots, many of its roots are based in indigenous music. So I'm going to do that by starting out by putting a circle of sound around us. Now, in indigenous understanding, circles are very important to our understanding of the universe because this whole idea I'm glad the professor had some very interesting, uh, very interesting data to share with us, and I'm glad he was identifying some of the perpetrators of this great crime, of this illusion of race and status that's been imposed upon the human race. So to get back from that, uh, we need to look to the circle. 
And I'm going to start out by putting a circle of sound around us and explain that, why that's important in indigenous understanding. just explain a little bit about myself very briefly. I come from a place called Quantucket. Anybody know where that is? Connecticut. Yeah, That's right. And Quantucket is one way to say it, but the, the pronunciation that uh, is really closer to the way people spoke it back in the day was uh, Quantucket. And that means long tidal river. And because I come from the river, river is very important to me. I come from a community that became known in modern times as uh, the Windsor Indians or uh, the River Indians. They had a lot of other names for us, but we won't go into that. But um, basically, to explain it, Pequonic means village by the water, and that's an Algonquin word um, which uh, reoccurs not only in what's the town where my father was born 103 years ago in Windsor, Connecticut. Pequonic is also the original name of Bridgeport. There's Pequonics in eastern Connecticut. There are Pequonics all the way up the coast of Maine. There's Pequonics down in New Jersey and probably beyond that. And what all of these Pequonics have in common is that geographically they can be reached by the water with a canoe. And that was one of the reasons. And they've always been places where people congregate. So I'm going to give you some different examples of indigenous music. And I don't want to say Indian or Native American, especially at this time, this month of October, because when we talk about this illusion of race that's been put upon us, you know. Um, the illusion of status of certain races over another. We have to understand that this coming day, October 12th, which has now been rechristened Indigenous Peoples Day, is to mark the time when uh, we celebrate Indigenous people, but also look back on that the source of white supremacy really began that day, October 12th, and something we should reflect on on this October 12th that's coming up because uh, we're in the midst of a, a great cultural war that's, war that's going in people's minds right now. So I'm going to uh, start off by playing some music that comes from, uh, it's actually one of, the, one of the origins of what we call rhythm and blues. And because you can do a little, you can keep your mask on if you like. You can do it and sing softly. But uh, and, uh, I'll demonstrate for you a style of music called stomp music. Now stomp music, the, most, uh, the best examples of it, because people do it all around the East Coast and now throughout the whole hemisphere, well not the hemisphere, but this, this country in the United States. But stomp music is, uh, is an ancient form of music that uh, people use to celebrate harvest, to celebrate the transition of uh, seasons to celebrate life and uh, celebrate warriors. So I'm going to give you an example of some different types of stomp music, and then I'm going to show you how stomp music has influenced, for instance, rhythm and blues. Now, the words I'm going to be singing in these uh, songs are what we call vocables. Anybody know what vocables are? Vocables are words that don't have a meaning, but we know what they mean. You know what I mean? Yeah, so there's all kinds of vocables. Now, I'm going to start out by doing a little call and response. When I, uh, when I, so when I go, you, I want everybody from their gut to answer, he, you, 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 you. Now repeat this. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Now 
let's take it back. You, 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 Now the third one we're going to do is uh, I'll say you ali ali and you respond with just a little lower go you ali ali so let's try you ali ali you ali ali you ali ali good now here we go let's start from the beginning and see how much we remember and I'm making a survey here. I want to see, you know, what races remember the most. No, <laughs> so let's try this. You, 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 hey, 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 you Ali Ali, you Ali Ali. Okay, now, you're doing so good, I think we'll go on with it. A <laughs> couple more things in. I'm going to go, way away, Iona. And when I say that, I want you all to go, hee ho. All right? Way away, Iona. Way away, Iona. Way away, Iona. Way away, Iona. Okay, good. The last thing we're going to do is, Everybody take a deep breath and let it out. And we're going to go. Oh, yeah! And then inhale and go. Hey! <laughs> so are you ready? Yep. Let's try. Deep breath. some of the things that native people talk about because again this whole idea of race is, is madness and um, what we believe is in the circle of life and doing that water is one of the most important things water is powerful well I mean you stop and think about it one of the legacies of racism and slavery in this country is that many African Americans don't swim and one of the reasons for that it's not because Africans don't like to swim. It's because when you people are enslaved, you are not taught to read, you're not taught how to write, and you're not taught how to swim. Because if you can swim, you can get out of anywhere. Because when you run, at some point, you're gonna have to cross water. And if you can't swim, it's all over. So that's, I want you to think about water. And this uh, song is called Witchy Tide Toast. Everybody say Witchy Tide Toast. Give me what? Give me what? Give me what? Oronico, Oronico. Hey, nay, hey, nay. Hey, 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 No way. No way. No way. No way. Ooh, baby, baby. Ooh, baby, baby. Nah, I just want to see if you paint. 
All right, so here we go. Now, sometimes I'm going to sing this song. Now, I'm going to just give you a quick example of the song before I do it. I'm going to sing the first part in the vocables, and the second part's going to be in English. And it goes like this. Uchi Tato, Gimi Wau, Waniko Wane, Waniko Wane, Vianane, Nemoa. Uchi Tato, Gimi Wau, Waniko Wane, Waniko Wane, Vianane, Nemoa. Water spirits sing and feeling round my head. Make me feel glad that I'm not dead. Uchi Tata, Gimi Wau, Raniko, Raniko, Hene. So let's try this song just with the vocables and I'm going to start lower and I'm going to raise the intensity because in, in indigenous music all around the planet there's often the call and response and the call and response when uh, in call and response you have to uh, follow what the leader's saying. Sometimes I'm going to sing it higher, sometimes I'm going to sing it lower, sometimes I'm going to slow it down. But uh, the important thing is to stay, stay the course with it. And we're going to go through the whole, because music and everything in life and in the universe boils down to a wave. You have light waves that give us life, water waves. The waves of mountains are waves that move over millions of years. We even have a wave, hey baby, what's happening? There's all kinds of ways, but it's very basic to human existence. And when you understand that all waves have a certain frequency, certain frequencies that they all share, and infinite variations on those frequencies which they don't share, it ha kind of helps you, so to speak, surf through life. So understanding things in terms of hemispheric principles, and one of the hemispheric principles that I want you to keep in mind is that circle and cycle of life. So, let's do this song, Wiki Tai To. I'll slow it down. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, good. Wiki Tai To. Give me one. Oro Niko, Oro Niko. Oro Niko, Oro Niko. Well, we are the one. <laughs> Let's try be on, no, it's important, you know why it's important to be on the one? I'm not doing this just to be funny. It's like being on the one helps prevent heart disease. Because rhythm is what your heart runs on. When you practice rhythm and really stay on the one, as the Prince of America once said, stay on the one, it'll help you beat heart disease. You know, so I mean, not, not saying nothing is absolute, but it definitely helps. And your friends will dig you too. So let's try from an American country. When I say an American country, we all know what an American is, right? Do Americans come from Cuba? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. They come from Canada? 
Mexico? Yeah. Brazil? Yeah. Right. Very important thing to remember. So I'm going to play some music from an American country. See if you can guess what country this comes from. And this is uh, indigenous music. to some North American music and show you, give you an example of another root of rhythm and blues music. Actually, maybe I should use the drum on this. No, I think you get the idea with this, the, the rattle. Now, there's, there's a form of music that maybe people do, a social dance called the 49. And the rhythm is this rhythm that you're hearing right here. It's called two steps. And the style of music goes like this. Way Normally, oh, oh, okay. Well, normally you're supposed to. <laughs> normally you're supposed to uh, do this with the drum, but since I only have four minutes left, I'm just going to get into my traditional instrument, saxophone. And I'm going to leave you with a circle of sound with that great indigenous art form that we all love, also known as J A Z Z, that we all have a hand in. And hope you dig this.
will find the harmony of love to love into. East of the sun and west of the moon. Basically, there's a lot of information about uh, Native people here in Connecticut, but to make it very simple, everybody knows the Mohicans. The Mohicans started as Pequots. Everybody knows the Pequots. The Pequots started as Mohican or Mohicans. The history of Connecticut is very misinterpreted, so this kind of sets things straight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being here. God bless everybody. Thank you, Lee Mixer Sean Rodney. And I've had the pleasure of enjoying Mixer Sean's presentation since we were high school mates back in the late 60s, early 70s. And here we are, you know, wave artistry works both on all planes, keeping us young and vigorous in our approaching elderhood. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not yet. I, I can't concede yet. <laughs> but I uh, thank you so much, the wave artist, Lee Mix, Sean Rossi. Um, we have also on tap Michelle Thomas, but I'm not sure if we're going to proceed. Uh, is Miss Thomas here? Okay, so are we concluding our afternoon session, or are we going to bring on uh, Miss Magella? Mark on her presentation on colorism. I want to hear on really quickly. We're going to be doing a quick uh, segment on myths and stereotypes in Black Americana. With Magella. Why I'm going to introduce her. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. For the sake of time, I'm just going to abbreviate. Um, some of you may have noticed in the back of the room that we have a Black Americana. Uh, historical memorabilia collection as a part of this project in our exhibit today. I'm going to invite you to uh, just to take a look at that having after, after having listened to uh, just a very small segment on this topic. Sort of, uh, sort of fits into our chronology even of today because we really want to see where we are checking currently uh, with some of the racial stereotypes and uh, some of the racial narratives that we've inherited. Now we know a little bit more about where some of these things have come from, but let's take inventory of what's going on right now on October 4th, 2020. And Janae, if we can, just want to introduce her. Uh, Magella Mark is a native of, a, a Connecticut native, and she was born to immigrant parents who came to the United States as artists from the Caribbean island of Grenada. She graduated from UConn with a degree in media and society studies, focusing her independent major on the influence of media on the culture and vice versa. She earned her MBA degree in international business, studying abroad in London at the European Business School of London. Currently, she is an analytics professional in New York City who creates performance analysis and strategic planning for major television networks such as Spike TV, NBC, Freeform, and ABC for the tech company TiVo. As a data story creator and progressive tech enthusiast with years of experience in advertising and marketing, she has worked for major corporations such as Turner Broadcasting, 
ESPN, and the Weather Channel. She has conducted numerous workshops, including the Wakanda workshop to address racial inequalities using Marvel's Black Panthers, Black Panther film as a reference point and the Judy Chicago's inspired art piece for the workshop. Pizzy Plate Painting Party to address gender inequalities and the objectification of the female body. She is also a writer and artist involved with many organizations including Support Creativity, the United Nations Association, Womanly, Black Women's Blueprint, and others. Please join us in welcoming, welcoming Michelle Mark. I am a researcher. Um, I also conducted a lot of various workshops, etc. And um, what I'm going to be discussing today is this idea of colorism, but from the perspective of how decisions led up to it, right? And the standard of beauty and that kind of relations to each other. Right, so that's why I have here lovely black womenhood sold in a bottle on Amazon. Right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm Magella. This is me on the list. I don't know if you can't read from the back. Yes, that is me. Again, I do a lot of intersectionality workshops um, from the Wakanda workshop to the Masterpiece Exercise, but most people know me for uh, the workshop inspired by Judy Chicago's piece, The Dinner Party, called, and excuse me for children that will be watching, The Pussy Play Painting Party, right? So what is choice? So first, I would like to say, right, I strongly recommend that everyone do their own investigation of the truth. I am one individual who's providing you information, right? But it is up to you to go ahead and actually do your own research, not just, you know, click on Wikipedia, that's on the first page of Google. Actually read things, listen to people, etc. right? But we're gonna look at this idea of choice, right? So the definition of choice, an act of selecting or making a decision when faced with two or more possibilities, right? And I know you said that, Mike, right? I'm gonna look at this. Let me know if this is too loud. Okay. I'm gonna use my phone too because I did this presentation on the train here. So, excuse me. So this idea of choice, right? Um, okay, just putting aside this idea that free will is an illusion, because I know philosophers like to go ahead and argue that, and just let's go ahead and try to keep our sanity by just playing with the idea that we actually have choices, right? With that, we have to think about this idea that someone chose to sell human beings on wholesale. Someone decided to buy those human beings on wholesale, then ship those human beings throughout the Western world, and then sell those human beings on retail, right? And then someone chose to go ahead and, at an auction, buy those human beings at a retail price, and then keep their investment at any means necessary. Right? What are we talking about? Slavery. So, choices was made, right? You have many individuals, anomalies, abolitionists, there we go, I got it, um, who kind of swimmed against the wave, right? Swimmed against the flow and really thought about this idea of like, mm, I don't like the way that goes, right? But when you have social pressures, when you have a society where everyone feels comfortable, you're going to have the majority just going along with the flow, right? So the question is, who is valuable, right? So when we actually look at the actual idea of either, you know, systematic racism or social pressures of colorism or this idea of self-hate, right? We're looking at the idea of how we value ourselves, but also how we value other individuals, right? 
throughout history, and we're gonna focus a lot on the United States, this was the value scale, right? The darker the skin you were, the less valuable you were, right? And based off of the concept of slavery, we know the house slave versus the field slave, those who were favored, those who were less favored, correct? And we could see it throughout history again, and this idea of you know Howard University and the founding of sororities, where you have the paper bag test, right? Or you have also these ideas of who could even be identified as black or other, right? Or white and other, with the one drop rule. I think when we also look at the idea of unity, right? For a long period of time, before the idea, oh, my mom's calling me. Hold on. I'll talk to her later. Okay, so, <laughs> so <laughs> when we look at the idea of unity and the actual, what stemmed from the actual idea of using race to go ahead and operate and manage in confined slavery, you have to think about incidences, right? So the incident of the Beacon Rebellion, it came about in the 1700s. You had the idea of Native Americans, slaves, and indigenous, indigenous servants coming together and actually fighting in rebellion. Oh, okay. <laughs> fighting in rebellion, right? That triggered the strategy to focus on slaves solely being black, and just a service managing those slaves, and Native Americans being tossed aside, right? We have other instances, though, in the past. So this idea isn't new just in the United States. You think about Carthage, the empire of Carthage, ruled by the awesome Hannibal, right? The Romans considered him a barbarian. He was on the African continent, and he was one of those who were bold enough to go ahead and fight against the almighty Romans. But how he did that was actually unified all the barbarians together. And so even though it took a couple hundred years, they did eventually dismantle the Roman Empire. But again, it took the unity of all those, not thinking about skin color, what have you, to actually go ahead and dismantle those who were the oppressor. Right? And I know we have a lot of aunts and uncles in here, so if I'm saying something, you're like, no, sis, that's not right. Just let me know. This is, you know, this is a safe, safe space, safe space. Yeah. Okay. So who's considered beautiful? So we have two lovely photographs. Do anyone have any idea? The ethnic group of this woman here? I know, we have like a whole podium block in your way. That's all right. So, this idea of what is considered exotic and what is considered grotesque has been going on for so long. Um, this is actually during the same period of time, right? This woman, I guess on your right, is a Circassian woman a Circassian beauty, as they call her, right? She's from the ethnic group from the Caucasus Mountains. In terms, you know, Caucasus, Caucasian. So the Caucasian world, the, the Caucasian War lasted from 1817 to about 1864. And when did U.S. slavery end? 1865. This woman here was considered exotic beautiful. She was the actual manifestation of femininity and beauty. Have you noticed something they have similar? Mmm, yeah, she had that texture, right? That's that, that 4C right there, okay? <laughs> but she was considered beautiful. She was put on a pedestal. The Americans and Europeans went ahead and showcased her on side shows, went ahead and had her on postcards so the lovely men could have something to fantasize about. But somehow, she, right here, was considered a savage. This black woman here was a slave during that time. This black woman here was not considered beautiful at all. 
And can you tell, even though, yes, you notice they have pretty much the same hair texture, what made them different? And what would society consider them one beautiful and one not? Yeah, the skin color. Now this still plays out. We see it even when we have our kind of natural hair movement, where the representation commercials are, you know, those who have three, I mean, three B and above, right? Or those who might consider the token black person in a commercial or on the show, because you can't have, you know, a backstory for a black character. You definitely can't have two, you know, two black people in one show. That would just drive people nuts. So this concept is not new. This concept has been around as long as the oppression of people who look like me, right? And sorry for going back and forth like this. It's going to take a lot of time. So who is the right shade? Does anybody know who these two women are? That would be amazing. No, though. Um, so these two women. So this woman here, and I'm going to butcher her name, so I apologize if she sees this, um, is Nayara Justina. She won, right, the how do I mean, Global Leza Caribbean Queen pageant in 2013 in Brazil, right? Then that title was taken away from her because the people of Brazil spoken, and they said, she is too dark. How dare you? She does not represent Brazil. She's blackity black. We can't have that. Right? So what did they do? They replaced her with a more palatable young lady. Right? But don't worry. Black Twitter went ahead and took that. They went ahead and dragged Brazil pretty hard. So she got deals and all that stuff. So she's doing fine. But the idea that they would go ahead and replace her based on the comfort of not only their government, but just the people in general who thought, you know what, we don't like her being the ideal beauty for Brazil. So therefore, we need to find someone who was more of the liking of their people. And it's quite unfortunate, but that happened right in 2013. Just right, South America. Okay, just make sure. I'm trying to keep this under 10 minutes. So I'm like strategizing. Okay, so the idea of who can switch, right? Do anyone know the difference between passing and black fishing? Yes, we'd like to go ahead and give us a, this is interactive. We're gonna go ahead and do a class here. Yes. Passing, so my sister is actually Good for you. I don't have a gold star for you, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I bring you and throwing you a lot of love. Yes. So I'm going to give you the technical definitions of passing and black fishing. So passing, the racial, or racial passing or passing was originally coined in, to define the experience of mixed race individuals, particularly in America, who were accepted as a member of a different racial group, namely white. Right. This term became more popularized, you could say, by an author named Nella Larson. Her, her 1929 uh, book uh, by the title Passing was based on her experience doing so. Many individuals who will be considered African American, right, that one drop rule that I mentioned before, they will be considered African American, but because at this point, they have become so mixed and their lineage has been so far, even though they probably have one relative that is black, right? They were still considered African American, but was able to pass. So you have instances of a lot of individuals passing based off of survival, okay? Now I wanted to make this very clear, it's off of survival. I know many throughout history 
had decided, you know what, I could, I had the opportunity to take a safer route and not be objectified to racism if I went ahead and start over, right? So they took that opportunity. They left their families, they changed their name, they moved to a new town, probably in the opposite end of the country, and started over as a white person and lived their life. This actually is the image of a mother, of a woman who discovered that her mother was passing in a book called White Like Her. So you could definitely go ahead and Google that book and you could find out more about that. When she discovered that her mother actually said, please don't tell anybody until I'm dead. Because that's how scared she was. To lose not only her family, but her friends, and to also risk being put into danger in her mind, right? Now, blackfishing, this is another thing that has come about in the last couple years, right? I know you're shaking your head, girl. I know, it's a hot mess. Hot mess. But we just keep on watching, aren't we? We just, we just keep on watching. Okay, so blackfishing, technical term. Commonly, perpetra commonly perpetrating by, common, commonly perpetrated by females of European descent, which involves artificial tanning and using makeup to manipulate facial features in order to appear to have some type of black ancestry, African ancestry, right? So black fishing, it was a term that came about by Juana Thompson um, that went viral in 2018. So this is recent. And she pretty much wanted to go ahead and have black Twitter to drag the life out of her. Right? Pretty much in her tweet, she said, all of the white girls cosplaying as black women on Instagram. Yes, and she was a spokesperson. I don't know what her name is. She's some Swiss girl from, <laughs> I know, right? She's some Swiss girl from, you know, I don't know how. And she ended up betraying a multiracial woman for a long period of time until she was, I guess you could say, caught. She said that she just tans easily. But, you know, we have her. <laughs> you would give me life right now. Yes. <laughs> Um, so she, yeah, so she pretty much was dragged on black Twitter, Instagram, everywhere because people were very concerned about this idea that she was able to get Instagram sponsorships and et cetera, et cetera, with people perceiving her as mixed race. Now, here's the issue with this, right? There, and we have some in the crowd, there are actual biracial, multiracial individuals, exactly, in the world. So when you have these issues of someone who is portraying themselves as multiracial, having ancestry of the African continent, you have the concern of now the black community is gonna question every tan looking person with somewhat of a curly pattern. White people are gonna be questioning, well, I don't know, is she? Is, she could just be Italian. You're gonna have all this chaos that come about, right? And we end up having these kind of false narratives created in a space that's supposed to be safe for whoever is supposed to be in that space and feel that they're able to connect with like-minded individuals, right? So don't blackfish. There's no need. Just say that you just, you're really good at tanning. That's fine too. If you just, Glowing skin. But here's the thing that a lot of people, I guess a lot of people have um, kind of a complex, a complex um, feeling about, I'll say that, feelings, right? We'll use feelings. There are individuals in the country alone who are biracial, who are multiracial. There are specific groups, ethnic groups of people, the Creole people who are mixed with Native American, with those of African descent, of European descent. And so they are a group of people, and they may actually look like either her, her as dark as me, and they are identified as Creole. You have those, and that's in Louisiana. You have a whole group called the Mongrel Virginians. I don't like that term, but that's what they identified as. But that was in Virginia, and it's called the Wind Tribe. Again, they were African descent, Native, and European descent, right? And they also was isolated and kept apart because some of them were passing, and therefore a lot of the people in Virginia 
the white community was very concerned that they might mix up and breed with them, right? So they had to keep them out in mountains, got to keep them separate because we don't want none of that native blood. We don't need none of, that, none of that melanin, right? And then you have a whole separate group, and recently the Guardian themselves went ahead and did the article of a town. It was a town created specifically for those who were, I guess, tainted with African blood, right? And that was East Jackson, Ohio. And there's many who still identify as black, despite the fact that they are so far removed that they just know what those before them taught them. And so they are rooted in that. But I guess the conflict come with that situation is that the younger generations where at this point, blonde hair, blue eyes, they think we're just gonna identify as white because we're seen as white and it's easier, right? It's the term easier, back to that scale of value Right? I am more valued as one versus the other. So why would I go ahead and put myself through that situation to be less than or seen as less than if I could just take the easier route? Oh, now this one, hot take. Who can claim blackness? So in this picture here, this slide, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of reactions. In this slide, who is actually multiracial and who is not? We have here the infamous queen of it all, transracial, poster child, Rachel, Rodazol, Rachel Dolezal. We have Jessica Krug, she's the most recent one, right? And then a lot of people kind of, oh, so, oh even the mic, I'm sorry. Rachel Dolezal? Oh, and Jessica Krug. Yeah, Jessica Krug, Rachel Dolezal. And this one here, she's the new one that came out. People have actually missed her. I didn't, because I'm nosy. <laughs> So this woman is named C.V. Vitola Haddad. And so she was also a PhD student. I believe a PhD student, U student. Or I know she was a uni university grad student. Oh, am I messing up? Oh. Um, and she herself has just came out as someone who has posed as multiracial, but she's actually Italian. And I don't actually know the ethnicity of Rachel, but I know Jessica here. She's actually Jewish. Now, that becomes a big problem for those who are multiracial, right? We have, and I'm sorry if I butchered it, what is it? Halsey? Halsey. She's actually biracial, right? She's a music artist. And she has been attacked on numerous occasions for either having cornrows or displaying certain gestures and what have you. And then this one here, she's from Pretty Little Liars. Remember that show, right? Well, some people remember that show. Um, and her name, and I'm gonna butcher this as well, is, Troy, is it Troyan Belisario? And she's also biracial, and she was on the show. And she's also on multiple shows, and she's actually also biracial as well. Um, again, I know that I'm supposed to focus on the pressures of like what it is to be dark skin and struggle and like how dare like people go ahead and say that I look like a monkey and blah blah blah. My mom loves me right now. <laughs> I have the collar back. But I really wanted to focus on this idea of when people feel violated in their own space, when people feel a sense of betrayal when they feel manipulated, when they feel like someone is exploiting their suffering and exploiting their struggle for some kind of validation of connecting with the struggle as well. And we've seen it. Some of these women have justified, like, you know, they're presidents of the NAACP in their town, you know, they're the professor for African American studies. And then they went ahead and they just wanted to connect. They wanted to go ahead and feel you know, that, that same oppression, that history, right? But really all that does is make the black community mistrust 
that just go ahead and bring about a lot of this idea of isolation and separation. Because now we don't know who's who. And as we were trying to go ahead and just see each other as individuals and not by skin color, as we are also trying to go ahead and grasp our own identity back that was stolen, now you have others who are kind of using it as entertainment or as someone claim it as blackface, you know, I'm sorry, as uh, black fishing, cosplaying, pretending to be black for the sake of, oh yes, please. Why wouldn't they all be classified as passing instead of black fishing? So the reason why they won't all be considered passing is because many of these women, right, this woman here and that woman here who actually have DNA, who actually have ancestry that is of Africa, they have to deal with the feeling and triggering of their actual history. So yes, they are passing. Yes, people won't just automatically just assume that they have black ancestry, but at the same time, they themselves know they do. And so a lot of times you will have the instance of being in a conversation where white people might be saying something racist, and because the white people don't know that they are, maybe their father or their grandfather or their grandmother is black, they just assume that they're in a safe space to go ahead and pretty much talk shit. But they, they now have to go ahead and deal with that. They have to go ahead and deal with this idea of, oh, so this is how they really feel. Even though someone I love who is darker than me, who cannot pass in society as white, who has probably faced racism, who probably faced oppression of some type, right, is now have to go ahead and deal with this idea of, well, who am I to you then? Because I also have a lineage. I also have a bond. Oh, yes. And thank you for giving that example. I truly appreciate it. Because like I said before, there's a lot of instances where people have faced this oppression, have faced disrespect. And unfortunately, a lot of people have the option to not face that if they could just pass. But to go back to your question, for those who are not of African descent, right? Those, they do not have a relative from what they know of who is of African descent, they are taking on a persona. That's what they're doing. They're taking on a persona. They're choosing, and here's, okay, here's a good way of putting it. They're choosing oppression. They're choosing to go ahead and get death threats. They're choosing to go ahead and take on the life that so many have been born with and they have no choice. They can't just hop in and out of their blackness. You understand what I mean? They can't just, you know, just decide one day, you know what, mm, this is too much for me now. I'm gonna go ahead and get a flat iron and you know, and live a better life, right? Live my best life as the privilege. That's not, you know, they have the option to do that because they don't have that connection. They don't have that ancestral connection with go ahead and ground them with this idea of their continent of Africa. And so they have the option to go ahead and play a character when they want to. Whereas those who have, again, like I said, they have a grandmother they have, you know, they have a grandfather, they have a mother, they have a father, who is more apparently black. They, they are darker. So they cannot go into the world not getting harassed if there is a possibility. They have a, b a bigger chance or a, 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 a higher chance of getting uh, harassed by the police, of being, you know, objectified, 
of possibly having to code switch at work to go ahead and make everyone else feel comfortable, where they don't have that issue because they pass. They don't have that issue. Oh, yes. I think you said that this recess, I'm old. Okay, oh. so my perspective is going to be different, and I'm not going to go into the, the, the time element. But Remember Merkel, the one who's married to the prince? Yes. Okay. Is this when it kind of came into more awareness because of all the problems she had? With no. Him? It's prior to this? this yes. Okay. Yes. How long? Like, when? Like, Girl. Like <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> when you. <laughs> Girl. Oh, ma'am. Auntie. I'm telling you. Yes. Huh, yes. You want to talk about what is color, what is race? Let's talk about Kamala for one minute. Yes. So <laughs> I feel like it's unfortunate that um, is a, there's the convenience of, the, I guess, also the media. I work as a media researcher as well. So the idea of one minute she is the first Asian so and so, you know, in California. But then now she's able to go ahead and hop in. Again, it has. No responsibility of hers. She, you know, I, I could say that my brother actually works on the Biden Harris campaign. I uh, haven't seen him in weeks. Stress. When I tell you stress, okay. So now she's seen as the black VP candidate, right? And, and I just want to add that for, for some of my white friends, the, the narrative that I hear from them now is she's not black. Right. She's not black. She's not she's black not enough. Black. She's, she's not black. Not really black. Yes. She's not black enough because she was not raised by a black mother. So therefore, she does not hold the black culture, and so she cannot go ahead and identify and represent black people. So that is what is being said. And it's not just one ethnic group or another. It's just, just overall, you have different feelings about it. Right. She is not Asian enough. She is not black enough. She said that, the black people or the white people trying to get... Both. 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 Oh, my. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> What's going on here? 2020 is just a mess, isn't it? Yes, I know. So, yes, that is what the problem is. A lot of times, and again, I am not very racial. I cannot speak to them. Again, I'm getting a lot of love right now. I cannot speak for multiracial or biracial individuals. But from the research I have conducted, there is this issue of them not feeling black enough in one instance, but also they're not feeling the other, which is Asian, Hispanic, you know, white. It doesn't matter, right? Because they are seen as this kind of invisible line, this, this, this boundary, right? And so they have to, and it's unfortunate because they have to make a choice a lot of the times. They have to make a choice. And a lot of times they're seen as wishy-washy. If decided that on this scenario, they got inside based on the perspective they have on one situation, and then they, they decided, you know, from this perspective is the other. Is and again, you can go ahead and correct me. This is a safe space. So, I think what with Kamala Harris' situation is the fact that now she's in a predicament where is hmm, right. Okay, hot take. Yes, there's she's right now. She's in a position where she is kind of being tokenized to go ahead and fit this idea of, well, she's a woman of color, so we're going to get the black vote, we're going to get the Asian vote. She was perfect. Did Biden want to choose her? Who knows? But you know, as far as strategy, she was suited. And I know that sounds messed up, but it's facts. And this is not inside information. I don't want my, I don't want my brother coming for me. I, uh, I don't want my brother coming for me. So, <laughs> this is, no, this is like, no. So, um, but I think that is the, the, the problem. And mind you, 10% of the population right now is identified as either biracial or multiracial. That is going to increase as more and more individuals are going into interracial relationships. I mean, there was a Time Magazine with a cover that expressed that yes, you know, the, the future does look all interracial and mixed up. And there's going to be a point where we're going to have to go ahead and get rid of this idea of, like, who's black enough, who's not black enough, who's acting like an Oreo, et cetera, right? We're going to have to get rid of all of that. 
because there's going to be a point where you're not going to be able to know. And plus, let's not even forget about the fact that there's a lot of biracial and multiracial people who identify as one race. So even though they might be Japanese and, and white, they identify just as white, right? So we're not going to even get into the census. That's a hot take. We're not going to get into who is identified as what. But yeah, I'm going to wrap up. So we go back to this idea of choice, and I'm going to be very quick about this. Again, as I mentioned before, those who are able to pass, they have a choice to go ahead and take on the heavy weight of their ancestors or to pretend and put them aside and just live an easier life because they are displayed or appear Eurocentric, right? But then you have to also think about the idea of the black community as a whole, where we have the choice to not only accept those who may, again, take up space that we might feel like they do not understand where I'm coming from because they are lighter skinned. They do, do not face the oppression that I would based off of our shades. We have to go ahead and think about it in the sense of unity and what does that mean as far as our overall goal to have oneness in humanity, to have this idea of we are not just one people who need to go ahead and attack each other if it is Afro-Latina, if it is Aboriginal, if it is, you know, Adults, which is American descendants of slaves, if, or also known as, you know, Native Black Americans, or if it's, you know, those who are on the continent, right? Continental African. We have to think about the idea that eventually we're getting to a place where younger and younger generations are no longer even thinking about this idea of, you know, who, who am I and my identity as far as race or gender or orientation. They are fluid in all aspects of their lives. And I think it's up to those or older generations, including myself as a millennial, I know, ready to bash me, I'm a millennial, um, <laughs> who needs to go ahead and pave a way where they have that space to be as individuals in a collective, right? And not as those who have to pick a side or those who have to go ahead and face a lot of the same trauma or, or restrictions mentally, emotionally, you know, psychologically that their ancestors have in the past. They're in a place where the impossible is possible and we need to let them go ahead and express that. So as we have these issues of what was passing, to then those who are passing are not black enough, to then those who are black fishing for the sake of just wanting to be in and down, to those who really just are allies, there's a difference to all of it. There's a difference. And all of it is a choice. And we have to go ahead and make those choices every day, right? We wake up, if it's our body, if it is the universe, a higher power, they, it, it, it chooses us to wake up in the morning. And then we make a choice. Like, how black do I have to get today, right? Based off of <laughs> your budget, right? And then once that budget is tapped out, everyone's getting it, right? Or am I gonna take a day of blackness? Or am I gonna go ahead and celebrate as an ally and support the Black, black Lives Matter protest? Or am I gonna go ahead and you know what, call out black because I need a self-care day and I just saw a whole bunch of Instagram videos of someone being stomped on by the police. We all make a choice of how we're gonna go ahead and live every day in this sense of humanity and what does that mean? And yes, we still have issues of color. It's, not, it's probably not as cut and clean and dry as house slave and field slave but it's still there underneath. And as we go ahead and try to create these safe spaces for ourselves, for our allies, for our families, we need to go ahead and take into consideration that we have to go ahead and think about those who are around us and make sure that they are also in a space where they're able to also evolve, right? So again, just some homework, right? So 
just for people, and this is not, don't even think about the religious context of this. Just think about this idea. So thou art light unto the pupil of the eye, which is dark in color, yet it is the fount of light and the revealer of the contingent world. So this is the son of, the, of someone who's considered a messenger of God, Baha'u'llah. And the idea is black people are the pupil of the eye. Without the pupil of the eye, the world cannot see. And this was written in the 1800s. So with that concept, you have to think, you need the whole eye in order to be able to see, period. You have the pupil, you have the iris, you have the whites of the eyes. It all has to function together in order for you to be able to see. But you have to take into consideration this idea that without that pupil getting in that light, it's not going to work. So homework, just look into it. The Pupil of the Eye is a book. You can look into it. I obsess with it because it just brings me spiritual joy. But I just want to leave it as we have to go ahead and really take into consideration this idea of what it is mean to be human, not just I'm a white person, I'm a black person, I'm a Hispanic person, and what it is just for me and my life and my family, vote. Based on me, my life, my family, you have to think about the collective or it's not going to work. We are interconnected. We're a network. Ooh. And at that note, I feel like that's the universe saying, Magella, it's time for you to stop. <laughs> Yes. Yes, you could go ahead and find me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magella. It's been very uh, nourishing and sustaining all the presentations this afternoon. I'm very pleased uh, to be in the company of like-minded spirits and people attempting to engage with the reality of being a greater human being. Uh, we do have Michelle Thomas here. Will we be bringing you on for five minutes? And Michelle, as a remarkable artist, there are sterling examples of her work here in this show. And uh, let me just give a quick backdrop on Michelle Thomas, a 21-year veteran of the United States Air Force. Michelle Thomas recently earned her master's in art education from Central Connecticut State College. Her thesis project culminated with a showing at Workspace entitled Sankofa, which focused on race, identity, and place by looking back upon life, retracing historical events, and examining individual experiences. Michelle uses art as a tool to glean knowledge of self. Can we bring Michelle Thomas to the forefront? Thank you, Maurice, beautifully said. <laughs> Um, I will be brief. I, ha I have to um, go with my notes because this was literally uh, written this morning in light of what's going on. Um, so my segment is about art and identity. As a fine artist, I have a, a, a responsibility. This is personal for me. I have a responsibility um, to my community and to the world, uh, putting out images, putting out messages, the things that I'm affected by. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I'm also a thinker. I think philosophically about the things that I do and uh, who I am as an existent <laughs> you know, being. Um, and so I want to approach this like a conversation and you know, kind of philosophical thought. Um, when I uh, deal with art and identity, there, that is very heavy. And we could have a whole workshop and hours upon hours, right? I can condense my thought, what I want to, what I want to leave you with something. Um, but I will, you know, at, at least hit some of my bullet points that I want to say out loud, because I think it's important that we, I can't take it for granted that you all know uh, the visual impact of things. I can't take that for granted. So I want to start by, by asking a question. Why are people uncomfortable with the image of a black man? So just, just that, envision a black man. Why are people uncomfortable with that image? <clears throat> if, I, if I give you a word porn and then give you the word horror film, 
which of the two is going to make you most uncomfortable? In our society, we're desensitized to a, a lot of things, violence, namely. So people can go to the movie theater in droves, right, and watch a horror flick. But mention the word porn, what is porn really about? It's people having sex, which is a natural function, which is a natural thing between people. But a horror film that's someone is slaying, someone killing someone, taking so like the most horrific things you can think of, but yet people watch it like they're gonna stand in line for that. So that's one part of being desensitized. Uh, also, uh, just even the real brief, the concept of Hitler. One of his uh, mechanisms for controlling the minds was putting out propaganda, right, against the Jews. And this was early on, pamphlets and flyers and, you know, how, how horrible they were and disgusting and all the things that were said. So by the time that people were cooked in ovens, it, there was a certain, uh, you know, some people were like, yeah, they're the bad people. They deserve that. And there was like, you know, there's a desensitization. You're a step away from it. That's an, another way that that happens. In the movies, now, now, it be, now it's getting a little personal to us, right? So in the movies, as uh, how are black people portrayed? You know, our black men, how are they portrayed? Uh, we were having a, a discussion this morning about Denzel Washington. And when he played the role um, in um, at Malcolm X, right, a very positive, historic role, he had many films, John Q, many films where he played a very positive, upstanding, uh, you know, person and a hero, yet he, did, he didn't get an Oscar. But yet when he played in, um, help me out, training thank you, day. Training Day, um, you know, where he's that vilified, corrupt cop, now he gets the Oscar for that role. And there was a sort of rumbling, I wouldn't say an, an outrage or an uproar, there was a rumbling about it, but it was like almost like, we'll just take the scraps, like, well, he got the Oscar. But that's another way that we're, you know, that, that image was glorified. The negative image was glorified. <clears throat> and again, going back, you know, staying with the media, where you have the news, we're inundated with the news, right? The, the bad things, the horrors that happen. But you know, when you watch on the news, and, you, and it's our people, we're portrayed as what? The criminals and all the bad stuff you can imagine. Uh, one quick thing I'll say, I also was trained in the military as a journalist, and in that school, this is a, you know, it's really hard for me because it, it's, it's, it was a very telling thing, and this is something that I really want you to, to hear. In that school, um, during the segment when we had to do, uh, learn about interviewing, and you, you see the, um, the journalists on the street, and they're telling, you know, whatever the story is, and they pull the person in to get that sound bite, to get that quote. And it's always somebody who's not articulate, someone who is, you know, what was the, what was the one you said earlier? Was um, the one that went viral, you know, the, the young man who was like, hide your kids, hide your, you know. Like we know, we can say those sound bites ourselves and know that, and, and you know, that's how you know, we're portrayed. But th the horror is this. In that school, we were literally taught to seek out people of color and people who, are, who, who have that, uh, you know, uh, not articulate and, uh, you know, those, the stereotype. Because it sensationalizes the media, it sensationalizes the news. Now, it, and that was some, you know, many years ago, and in that role, I remember in that class, I challenged that authority. Um, and so in our discussion this morning, it was like, but I'm one person. You know, did I, cha did I make change for the greater good? No, I made change for the stay while I was there, because while I was there, did they do those things any longer? No, but when I, I'm also, uh, how many black women are in that position? Not many. You know, I'm one, one black face in a sea of white in a systemic, you know, uh, organization where that was in the curriculum. It wasn't just 
they're saying something bad about black people, that was in the curriculum. So I can, I can when I'm interviewing somebody, I cannot do that. But all of the people who graduated, that's, that's in their toolbox. They're not stopping. To stop that would have to be from the system down, would have to be stop the curriculum. And yeah, that, that's just something to leave you with so that when you're watching the news, know that these things are scripted, these things are taught, and that we have to be the gatekeeper of understanding that. That's, you know, that's just personal for me to you. It's like something really personal to kind of get out. Um, and then one, one last part of it is um, music. Um, again, we think that we're making all these choices in our life. We think that we, uh, you know, the music that we're listening to is like, oh, the person who's out there, they're so talented, that's why they became famous. But yet, I'm, again, I can't take it for granted that you already know, but we should know that the industry is scripted. It, they're, they're picking the people. You have a Cardi B that glamorizes, sensationalizes, you know, uh, a stripper from the bottom came up and now she's rich and that's what little girls are supposed to admire too, you know, and that's handpicked. Where, where's the rap, where's the songs about being a lawyer and a doctor and wh where are those raps? I want those raps. You understand? And so that's handpicked. And so we have to be informed and we have to know that these images, these words, these music, the, the news, everything is, is uh, we have to filter. We have to uh, know that this is affecting how we look at our brothers and sisters, how the world looks at. And then we have, you know, for me, I, I can't say you have to fight that. I, now it's personal. How do I fight that? I do that through my art. I do that through creating positive imagery because that's the way for me to say, no, we are kings and queens and we are beautiful and glorious and we stand and we will not you know, be affected by those things. I have a filter, I have a choice, I have a choice and that's extremely important. Um, so I'll leave you with, we're gonna, I'm gonna leave you with one last thing. I need my volunteer to come up. <laughs> you can actually stand right there. You can stand right in front of the, oh no, come right here. I'm sorry, because he has the camera. So stand right here. Hopefully everybody can see him. You wanna put your, your hoodie on? <laughs> so this is my, this is my image, since I don't have a painting of him. <laughs> this is my image of a black man. <laughs> right, so the first philosophical question was, why are people uncomfortable with the image of a black man? Here is this black man. Imagine this black man walking down the street. Imagine this black man just standing. Just this image right here, the black hoodie, the black mask, black boots, jeans, nothing else identifying him. And yet and still, just by the words, this image is somehow some scary image or some uh, you know, menacing figure where someone has to call and be like, somebody is somewhere where they shouldn't be. And, and, or if he's walking down the street and someone's walking and they feel fearful, they cut on the other side, right? So I'll leave you with this. How would you know, this is the question, how would you know that this black man has two beautiful children whom he loves with all his heart, gives his heart and soul to his children? Can you take your mask off, please? How would you know that this black man is an EMT? an essential worker and has been on the front lines of this COVID situation, day in, day out, long hours, in the thick of it. When I tell you in the thick of it, in the thick of it. Dealing with unimaginable illness and what's out there. Um, we're coming from New York. 
So you can imagine, <laughs> right? But how would you know that this black man is an ex-Marine, served our country, fought for our rights to be flipping about whatever they are? How would you know? How would you know that this is an intelligent black man who writes a blog, who writes about the issues that plague our community and fights for the things that we fight, we struggle with? How would you know? How would you know these things if the impression that is left upon you is that this black man somehow is menacing? How would you know? when that stops you from saying hello. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. Michelle Thomas, Michelle Thomas. And do view her wonderful work. She is part of this wonderful group art show. And I'd like to uh, let you all know that this is the first Sunday of four Sundays of uh, very inspired conversations around race and color. So do let all your friends know that they knew they're missing out. Go to southingtonarts.org. There's pre-registration required, as we know, with the COVID social distancing situation. But there are three more Sundays around this theme, what is color, what is race. So. Let folks know of this great gallery show going on to the 30th of October, very flexible viewing hours, I believe Tuesday through Sundays, Saturdays, and again, three more very poignant conversations and performances uh, around this very important theme. Uh, you know, our future revolves around us getting together finally as human beings. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I believe Ms. Garner might have some uh, closing remarks. I don't want to belabor our evening, but our late afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. We, I have been just tremendously blessed with information, and I need to now, like most of you, go somewhere and sit down and just, as I say in my Hebrew word, selah, take a pause. Also just want to acknowledge that we're in the Feast of the Inn Gathering in Sukkot during the next, I think, four days. It, uh, it began on October 1st and will end on October 8th. So just being culturally competent sometimes is also a part of what is color, what is race. I have this box, you're probably wondering what it is. We're gonna ask that you do a quick survey, which will take you one minute. I promise there are just three questions that we're gonna ask you to answer. And this will help us to better design and understand needs and just get your feedback and reflections. Um, there's going to be three more sessions. Uh, the last one is our community day, which we're going to be giving honors and recognition to many people in Greater Hartford that have contributed to this issue. That's actually a Saturday, the last, of, well, the, the third Saturday in the month of October, October 24th from 12 to 3. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to do this quickly. I just want to give some special acknowledgments and thanks to our community sponsors, the Grostein Memorial Fund, Coffee Memorial Fund at Main Street Community Foundation, and our host, of course, SOCA, the Southington Community Cultural Center. And that's really abbreviated because I couldn't say enough about them just going out of their way to accommodate this vision that I had to do something around race and color and to do it in a different kind of a way. Thank you so much for our wonderful youth volunteers. Uh, and also we just wanna thank all of our community members, our friends, supporters, patrons. Wanna say a special shout to Patricia Johnson from the Connecticut Artists Coll uh, Initiative and her tremendous support in helping us organize some of our presenters and guests and on and on and on and scheduling and other things and just helping us to put the pieces all together. For more information, I want you to just please attention our website, which is raceandcolor.org. We want to hear from the community. We want to hear from you. Whether you're in the uh, distant audience or whether you're present, you may have an article, you may have a paragraph, 
you need to speak up. You need to speak out. You need to release what is inside of you about these issues. Because believe it or not, one of the challenges in doing an event like this is that race and color covers the entire planet Earth. Everything on the Earth is tagged by race or color in terms of human beings. So we're all, it, that's why it's so weighty. That's why this is so hard. That's why there are millions of choices of people and content and we're dealing with COVID and trying to put different people together in different pieces because there's almost a million different ways that we can, uh, you know, position ourselves to address this tremendous issue. And we're just so thankful for those of you that were just willing to come out in the midst of a true pandemic and crisis. It just really shows you how important this whole issue is. I don't think I have anything else. If you could take one minute, do the survey. Um, you can turn them into one of our youth uh, representatives is what I would like to call them. They're not volunteers. They're much more than that. They're a part of this community and they are growing and learning as they go. I want to thank Maurice Robertson for just sticking and staying with us today. Um, believe it or not, we did this in a very short amount of time. And again, if you weren't here Thursday, I shared I was across the street on the green and I was talking to people and I said, I got to do something. I have to do something. And I think we all need to look at our own personal call calls to action. I don't have anything else. I want to thank Stan and Access TV. If you have family members or friends, of course, that were not able to attend, this will be made available to the public through Access TV, I believe, maybe sometime even tonight. Thank you all for coming, and we just want to give everybody a big round of applause to, your, to one another. Thank you. We recognize you. We love and appreciate you. We care. Good evening, and God bless.